This tutorial is going to be called uh, Sound Snake. This is a little continuation in some ways to uh, two days ago. This is the 28th day of 30 days of symmetry. And on day 26, we auralized uh, velocity, meaning we made uh, velocity um, uh, corresponding to pitch of an emitted object. And uh, today we're going to do something that is uh, quite similar in a sense um, where we're going to uh, emit, uh, we're going to be emitting an object here. Um, excuse me, let me turn my controllers on. We're going to be emitting an object um, and uh, give that object a pitch um, based on the uh, based on the, the height. Uh, of uh, where it's emitted, um, and you could you could change um, you could change the reason you could change the driving variable for pitch uh, as well as kind of the scale and mapping um, to suit kind of whatever you're going for. But the uh, the basic idea is to create something that that uh, you know has an emitter uh, on it that'll put these put these musical spheres out into the world. Um, uh, we went ahead and colored them um, based on their all corresponding to their frequency as well as their their height in the world, uh, which we learned uh, two days ago. Um, is actually uh, pretty easy. Actually, three days ago. And then we've got I don't know. I just chose a snake head um, as I was trying to you know I emitted these things and they looked like a snake and um, and I thought yeah let's just call it a sound snake. The other thing is, is that, as you can tell, not only am I emitting them once and getting a sound from them initially, I'm also um, have the ability to recall that sound and re-emit that sound. Um, and so, um, the what's what is set up here is um, gives you, you know, the opportunity. To, um, Gives you the opportunity to do interesting interactions with with the audio kind of path that you created, uh, the kind of a frequency path that you created. Now in this one, um, this is uh, using a, a, a clear step on the transposed pitch of the, uh, the the sound that's getting emitted. It's using a clear um, transposed pitch, which or sorry on the on the on the integers, the transposed pitch can be a continuous scale along frequencies. But here we're actually rounding so that we get discrete um, semitone steps, just like a piano um, would would have. But we can also do this um, in kind of continuous frequency based on the position. Uh, I've also got this little emitter. This would be kind of an extra um, that uh, is this particle. It's just a particle emitter emitting, as you can see, kind of a, a, uh, a musical note. It's very cartoony in that way. Um, that actually, I think, could be really interesting and fun to play with, where if you um, you could actually tinker with, uh, I don't know, the size of these things coming off, but um, I just thought it was kind of cool to have them get a little bigger and then uh, float up into the air. So, um, like I said, you've got this, uh, you've got an object that you can grab that is fixed in the air uh, that, it, that, that emits as you move an object. Um, as you move that object, it emits behind it. A, um, a musical sphere. That sphere is then colored by its by its height and um, has is now corresponding to an emission of a note. Upon whenever you hover over it, um, it'll then uh, it'll then play that note at that at that corresponding pitch. And then this is another sort of uh, I don't know what you'd call this. I, I sometimes think of it as a magic uh, butterfly net or kind of like these like a hoop with a that's able to kind of trigger things. Um, and the last thing is that these spheres glow as they, as they emit. Um, and uh, that's pretty much the, the principles, yeah. So you can, you can grab the, grab the snake and it emits a tail and it's colored and pitched and then you can go back over and activate it. And it's cool because you can activate an entire area of sound, uh, which I find kind of interesting. It doesn't have to be a like linear situation. So you can make a whole kind of sound cluster. And uh, imagine what data auralization might sound like. Oh, there's a pattern in this in this territory here. Um, 
you can hear all the notes kind of at once. So let's um, let's uh, let's build this up uh, from scratch. Station my my headset. So we're just gonna uh, we're gonna create a file new, and just for just for giving ourselves a place in the world, let's uh, let's let's do a let's p use the horizon tool and uh, put the pyramids out here, and uh, you know just for another quick change up, uh, let's do summer midday, and. Let's just draw a couple mountains. Just, just you know, just have a little Bob Ross moment. Kind of raise up a little territory. Give ourselves a little, little place to be. Um, so, what are we going to need to do to build our sound snake? We need, um, we need a, th we need those those musical notes, and then we also need like the snake head, um, and that that uh, snake head we actually got on. Um, we actually got from Google Poly, um, so we can go ahead and bring that in from, or you could bring in any head that you find um, in uh, Google Poly. This was Snakehead by Sky Sixty Four Sky, um, and uh, what you'll do is download it, download the OBJ. Um, I already have it, so I'm not going to download it. You'll download the OBJ. And then you'll come into symmetry and go file, import optimized, and assets. I I stored mine in the 3D Google Poly. And let's see, is it in my zips? Snakehead right here. So I'm gonna bring in the snake head. And that snake head should import to the center. Let's fly to it here. Oh, it's right beneath me. There you go. Okay, so we've got a snake head, um, and let's actually just take a look at how big that snake head's going to be. Uh, by pressing um, H, uh, we can get human scale, so uh, is that appropriately large and and ridiculous? Perfect. I, you know, when I, when I actually sort of thought about this from a design standpoint, um, what I knew is, I, I, I first started off with like giant spheres, spheres that were like, um, almost like yoga balls, like. Um, but then it was kind of difficult to manipulate individual ones or kind of get like sweep an arm over over many of them and so I ended up working with a sphere that was kind of more like a, a basketball relatively a basketball um, to a kind of softball size in that range um, and you could do you could even go much smaller right like it's totally up to you um, but we're gonna work with kind of something that's about human head height um, and we'll just work with this uh, snake as it comes in, the snake head, by, what's the name of the, Sky64 Sky, Google Poly Creator. Uh, we can press H to toggle our uh, human scale checker off, and um, this is going to be our handle, and so what that means is that since it's a Google Poly object, it doesn't come in with a rigid body, um, but we're going to go ahead and give it one. Uh, let's actually name it first, we'll just call it snake head. Just to, it doesn't always come in with some name. It doesn't always export with a name either. So you often see this thing called merge node. Uh, when you import optimized, it merges kind of all the different uh, material layers and stuff, so that you have a single object you can kind of mess around with. So um, this is going to work fine. Um, we just so we renamed it to Snakehead. We're going to click this little triangle right here, and we're going to hit Add Rigid Body, which will make it in playtime, as you can see. Um, flop around, but what we want is it to not flop around. We want it to just be kind of, uh, uh, we need it to be grabbable, so thereby we need it to have a rigid body, but we don't want the rigid body to actually be um, active. Um, it doesn't, it does not need to be active, so we're going to say active is false. Uh, it just needs a rigid body in order to accept uh, the grabbable fix, which we're going to use in VR to grab it with the laser. So you'll come under interactions. To make it grabbable fixed, you'll go to interactions, grabbable fixed, and then click it on the on the object. And right, it said pick a mesh entity with a rigid body. When I said grabbable fixed, and so it wants a mesh entity with a rigid body, and that's any of these entities as they come in normally, or this this uh, snake as it is here. Um, so um, in uh, 
so this uh, this object now is has uh, grabability, which when you interact with it in a 2D environment, you'll see this constraint, this fixed constraint. Um, that fixed constraint in VR means that we can move it around. So when we get into VR, we'll um, we'll be able to uh, to move this thing around. Okay, so this thing needs to trail an emitter behind it that emits um, that emits on moving. Remember, our our emitter can emit uh, an object either uh, based on a pulse or based on script or based on the timeline, um, like a, you know, which actually in, ends up being a, a script any or sorry a signal anyway, um, or it can emit as it moves. So. Um, an emitter can emit uh, as it moves through space. Um, so take this node emitter, for example. Um, you have the continuous pulse, which is um, telling this to emit in a constant pulse at one times per second. That's the continuous on the node emitter. Um, but we don't want that. We're not going to have this thing emit um, in a constant steady stream. We're going to emit based on um, uh, our distance in the... Uh, you know, our, di our distance covered um, in space. And so what we're gonna do is make moving uh, some amount. And let's say that our moving is, uh, let's say, uh, this is numbers of emissions per meter. So let's emit, uh, let's emit four per meter and see what that looks like. So we're gonna move the, oops. And the other thing I'm gonna need to do here is get rid of the, um, Get rid of the physics. So I'm going to make the initial velocity zero, and just to just to check it out. That's going to leave a pretty strong tail, like a tail that is fairly uh, closely aligned, so that there's kind of a, a continuous um, stream of of nodes behind it. So let's take our node emitter and take a look. So at uh, emit rate, we went four. Uh, units uh, per meter, and uh, that should work good. We'll we're gonna come back and tinker with this, um, uh, but the main thing to do here is connect it to the snake head, so that when we move the snake head, the node emitter will move with it, and then the node emitter will emit based on its changed position. So we'll we'll, we'll uh, grab the node emitter by the words here, and drag it into the snake head, so a child's. And then we need to take the node emitter and center it onto that snake. So we're going to select the node emitter. And since it's a child, when we zero out, when we zero it out in its uh, transform, it will now be positioned on the snake head. Um, and what I did was uh, said, you know what? And we can uh, obviously tinker with this a little bit later. I actually just moved it so that the node emitter is kind of at the back. Of the of the snake, so you can kind of position it off in the back of the snake, um, so that uh, it's not like emitting the the sound spheres into its own mouth. That kind of comes out of its its neck um, and looks more kind of continuous that way. Um, so this is uh, all we need to do for now. So now we need to just this is this is kind of the apparatus that will um, emit when it's moved. See, um, at playtime, nothing's happening if I move. If I move him, he mo he releases a sphere, and we're going to swap out this default uh, this default sphere um, with a sound sphere. So let's build our sound sphere. So the sound sphere is uh, going to be um, where most of the code uh, lives, and so what it's going to consist of is a sphere, and then the sphere is going to emit a sound. So it's a sphere, a sound, an emitter, and that emitter is pointing at a sound and uh, so let's build up the sphere uh, from scratch here so we we were thinking about something we'll bring this down here for reference uh, we were thinking something about we got a human here somewhere if I hit H you can see human scale oh, I had to exit draw mode so um, so under entities, we're going to go to sphere, and uh, I think I think we're looking at something like this. That should look just fine, and you can see that it's uh, 
you know, it's about about a basketball size. Um, so let's work on this kind of down here near the origin. Um, so this will be our, our sample sphere. And we're gonna need to do a lot of things to this. We need to change its color based on its, its height. We need to make it interactable so that when we hover over it, it not only glows, but it also, um, it'll also emit uh, something from an emitter that comes with it. Um, so this is um, our base here. So this sphere, um, is also going to need a, it's going to need an emitter and it's going to need a sound uh, to emit from. So let's actually bring in the sound first. So I'm, a, I'm going to bring in something that I got. Um, it's a sound, it's like a bass chop sound that I got from uh, royaltyfreeoffvoices.com. Um, we can also tinker with the cello, which we used two days ago uh, on day 26. And that was um, on, I went to edit, find on freesound.org I found a cello sound um, which I can import uh, now. Let's actually import them both because we might, might tinker with both of them. So under assets, audio, audio clips, uh, under freesound I have Tim Khan cello. So I could tinker with this one and let's also just import um, I think, let me search for it, bass chop bring this one in. So if we bring in a uh, bass chop, um, so these are sound uh, clips. Um, these are audio clips. They're not actually sound. Um, they're not actually uh, what are considered sounds because um, like we mentioned uh, in earlier tutorials, um, a clip has to get a spatial sort of um, in-world kind of wrapper. It needs like this wrapper of properties that sort of tell it how to interact spatially with everything else. So it's an audio clip which um, which is kind of you know a generic chunk of data and then this is its its local sort of um, this is its in 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 world in space uh, representation of this sound. And there could be different versions of this clip uh, in you know kind of represented by different sounds with different properties. So um, you could have, you know, different variations of these sounds, um, which is exactly what's going to happen for us um, today. We're going to be emitting, um, we're going to be emitting all different kinds of um, bass chops. They're going to be emitting, and then its transpose pitch value is going to be getting um, tinkered with as it's um, it's at different uh, heights in the y direction, and so. Um, what we might do, um, so this this sound right here, uh, it's it's going to um, if we p were to put its autoplay onto timeline, uh, we should be hearing it right here because it's playing automatically on the timeline, and you can kind of hear it there, boom there. So we don't want it to actually be on timeline. We're going to be emitting it from an emitter, which means that we want it to play at the moment that it gets copied. The a, a emitter emits, uh, it basically makes a copy, like a clone of the sound, and um, by virtue of that, we can set this autoplay to on copy, and we'll get the sound at the moment of uh, that the emitter emits it. And so now um, we'll have this effect happening uh, when we emit, and then we just need to set the pitch differently uh, to these. Um, these different sounds. So let's let's set up an emitter that will emit this sound. Um, so we're going to go to entity. Sorry, we're going to go to emitters and note emitter. And the first thing we want to do is uh, take this um, this emitter and make it sample. We want to take its its sample uh, and pick not not this default sphere that it is, but we're going to pick um, we're going to pick this uh, sound in the space. Um, you could also pick the sound over here as you're going in. Um, so this note emitter will now emit that sound, which means if we press play, it should be emitting on that default constant pulse once per second. And then when we hit stop, since it's an emitter, um, it gets rid of these playtime generated objects, um, which are these like sound objects. So it comes back to its original position, and there's no more sounds in, in the space. Whereas when I made copies of this, 
you know, they're, they, they, they actually stay because I, I, as this editor, have this magical ability to actually play time edit and create things in the space that I might want to keep. But a node emitter is running under the assumption that you don't want those things. You're just leaving those as effluent, as part of the gameplay, as part of the experience. And so our node emitter is emitting by default one per, uh, it's emitting one per um, second under this constant pulse. And we could, if we wanted to, um, keep, keep a constant um, pulse. Uh, you could imagine moving and uh, you know swinging this snake head through, and um, you know you're emitting these different uh, you know these different objects you know through. But um, we are going to handle this a little differently. Um, you can imagine that this is going to go onto the sphere, and the sphere itself is not going to move. It's going to make an this sphere is going to make one sound. It's going to make a sound once when it's emitted. So it's going to go blip when it's emitted. And then when I, every time I hover over it, it's going to make another, it's going to make another sound. Um, and so what we're going to do is actually use the, the um, on hover on interaction. When we hover over this, we're going to use that as kind of the, um, how do you say, kind of the, the trigger or the, um, the activator for this for this emitter to emit this sound. So let's set that up. So basically, we need to combine the node emitter and the sphere entity like this. We're going to make the node emitter a child of the sphere entity, like so. Um, and then we're going to um, center it on its parent, so zero out its trans its position, um, which means that. Uh, wherever the sphere goes, so we'll go the emitter, and we're going to be emit. Remember, we're going to be emitting hundreds of these behind this behind this snake. So this node emitter is going to emit this sphere, and this sphere, every one of these spheres is going to have um, a second node emitter on it, um, which is going to emit these sounds when it's hovered on. So let's actually just for for um, sanity's sake, just for organization's sake, take uh, we'll name our node emitters. So there's a snake head which is going to have a, um, we'll call it note ball note emitter. That will be the name, or like note sphere. Note sphere note emitter. This, this emitter is going to emit this note sphere. And we'll go ahead and call this note sphere. And then we'll call this note emitter underneath the note sphere the sound emitter, uppercase S, uppercase E, and we'll remember that. And so the sound emitter is emitting the sound, and we're going to make it um, emit. Um, it's going to emit not neither by a continuous pulse or by moving. It's going to emit by script, and that's the script we're going to set up in the on hover event of its parent sphere, the sphere named note sphere. So what we need to do on this sound emitter is get rid of the constant pulse. So we're going to set constant pulse under continuous to none, which means that um, it's not going to emit based on this pulse one time per second. And and emitting by moving is is going to be zero as well, um, unlike the velocity ball or any of um, that we did in the past. Uh, we're not going to use any of these emission rates. It's all going to happen by script. So. Um, Let's test and see if we can get a script that'll work that'll make this uh, sound emitter emit this sound. Um, and when it emits that sound, this sound, remember, is auto playing on copy. So when this emits, this will play sound. And so all we need to do is get this emitter to emit, um, which is, as a matter of fact, one line of code. And we'll set that up now. So the note sphere, uh, we want to, we could make it so that when we press it, we, uh, it makes a sound. That would be fine. Um, I decided I wanted to kind of like laser over in VR. I want to like laser over, um, I want to laser over like an entire, you know, segment of this, this snake of notes and get kind of a continuous flow of sound coming out, um, or a continuous, you know, sort of sweep of, of note, notes playing. And so I decided I'm going to try the using the hover on event. So first of all, like we've been learning quite a bit in the 30 days of symmetry tutorials, uh, we need to create an interactable, we need to make this thing interactable. 
And so what that means is um, we want the note sphere to have, we're gonna click right here, and we're gonna click the add interactable attribute, which means we have this uh, and all of the events under it. We're gonna go to the on hover on event, which will open the Lua scripting window. And when we hover on, what we wanna do is get our child object called sound emitter, and we want to emit the, emit its node. Um, and so the way that that works is we, can, we say self colon, and we, we find at lowercase f, uppercase node, uppercase find node, uppercase b, uppercase name, find node by name, open close parentheses, inside of that, we need to pass in a string, which means inside of quotes, we're gonna spell the exact the name of the child node that we're looking for. So we're finding sound emitter. And um, sound emitter is a, uh, it's a node emitter node, which means that it has, um, which means that it has the function available to it called um, the function or method of emit lowercase e uppercase node. And that will uh, emit the node that is the um, sample of this node emitter, which happens to be this sound. So when we uh, hover on, we should uh, emit this node. And if we've done it right, we should get a sound. And you can see the little purple, uh, you can see the, the, the object. Um, you can see kind of the, the purple instantiation of that sound. So that's great. Um, which means that um, we should be able to um, we should be able to now set this up to emit these balls, which then when we hover over them, um, we can emit the sound. So let's set that up. Um, so one of the things uh, I think is that this sphere is actually has a um, this sphere has a rigid body on it. And so we want to actually remove the rigid body so that it floats in air. Um, so we're gonna completely remove it. We could set it to active um, false, that would be fine, but we'll just go ahead and remove it entirely. So we'll hit uh, remove attribute on the rigid body under that note sphere, which means that uh, now when I move it, it stays there. So let's, um, let's kind of wire these two things we've now built together. So we're going to take our, uh, our snake and the note, it's the note sphere note emitter, the one that's going to emit the note spheres. And we want to pick uh, the note sphere to be, uh, be, to be the one, to be the sample so that we emit these. Um, the other thing that we need to do in both of these cases is make sure that these emitters emit as a copy, um, a full copy, not as a shared copy. Um, and uh, and that that will uh, preserve the fact that each of these things, as they change, uh, each each and every one of these that I create, I can create them dynamically, and they can have different properties. Um, they can have a different color, and they can have a different um, they can have different properties of um, child objects underneath them, which we're going to need to do. So when this snakehead moves and this node emitter emits four of these. Uh, note spheres uh, per meter, uh, each of those note spheres is going to need a different color and it's going to need, um, and uh, well actually it's, it's unclear, I think actually the way that we're going to have this emitter emitting is, um, is going to be different, but it definitely needs a different uh, color. Um, but the, the, the sound emitter is basically going to be the same. Um, it's going to change the value of this, this note. Um, based on its height, wherever it happens to live. So um, let's take uh, a look at what we've just done, which means that we're now emitting these note spheres. And as we hover over them, and this will be the same for our laser in VR, we're, we're now getting this, we're now getting uh, the emissions. So what, we, what we've uh, come a good way so far, we still need to um, color the sphere, we need to make it glow, and then we also need to change the pitch, which is kind of the, the, the kind of the main uh, crux of this, um, this piece. So um, we can make it glow actually on hover really cheaply because it actually happens to be a stock interaction that we've pre-made for you. So under interactions, you can go to 
the very bottom glow hover. And so if you take this glow hover and just click it on this sphere, you'll notice that you get this little node down here called uh, glow, which um, basically rolls its code up into the, um, the hover event of, of note sphere. And if you take a look then at the code underneath glow, uh, you basically have you have this. So glow, as you can see, um, goes and gets its parent node because it's sitting on this note sphere. It goes and gets note sphere, and it gets goes and gets the animator. Um, so we'll go here. Um, when you hover on, it gets its parent sphere, gets the animation um, of object color property. Um, it stops if there's any other glow in, in process. So this just like stops the animation in process and, and starts a new one. So that's just so that you can do it twice, but this is the main one here. It gets the animator, creates a key clip on the object's color property, and in the course of a tenth of a second, multiplies that object's color by 10, which is the equivalent of adding kind of HDR, which is this glow ability, which, um, which makes it brighter in the space than anything else. Um, and uh, then the exposure has to kind of deal with that. Um, and it looks like glow. Okay, so that's um, how the glow is gonna happen. Let's see if we've done that correctly. Um, let me press play and we are glowing. And when we emit that, we've got this glow happening. Very cool. So let's, um, let's color these uh, spheres based on our height. Um, so the way that we're going to do that is as we emit from our, uh, from our snake head, uh, that's the perfect moment to tell our sphere what color to be and how to be for, for perpetu in perpetuity. Um, that's how I'm going to set it up because in this case, I want the sphere to, I'm gonna, it's going to be one color and it's just going to stay in, in the air. But um, it's very possible that you, um, it's very possible that you could um, want the note, you could want this sphere to be constantly uh, changing its color. Let's say if you did leave a rigid body on it and you want it to bounce around and change pitch dynamically and change color dynamically, you could do that too. It'd be two different ways of setting it up. If you want it to change constantly based on its position, you would need to create an event on the sphere itself that would be like on tick or on move technically. Once it's moved, it would need to update. Um, it, it, since it's a position-based effect, it would need to use, um, you could use on move and then it would, it would happen uh, less times than uh, when it, uh, than every frame. On tick would run every frame. So if you want that to happen, um, so that if the sphere is like bounced around the, the, the room and you want to sample its pitch and see its color change dynamically, s do what I'm about to do in a function uh, called um, in on move on the note sphere. But since that's not the case for me and I want, you know, these, these notes don't even have a rigid body and when I instantiate them, I put them in the world, they just, um, they just sit there and, and, and float. I can actually set them during the moment that I create, set the color during the moment that I create them, which um, is the best way to do that is under the thing that's emitting them. Um, so this note sphere emitter sample, it's sample, uh, the thing that's emitting is this, uh, the actual note sphere. So on this note emitter, uh, we have an event called the uh, on emit event, which is the uh, e an easy opportunity to just come in here and tell the obj, the object that's getting emitted, the sample, which is the note sphere, obj.color equals uh, some um, value. And I could say my position, the node emitter's position in the, in the y direction. Um, so self colon get world position. So get the, the node emitter's position dot y, which would be, let's say if you swing this thing um, up you know, three meters, that's gonna be three, and if I put it all the way down to the ground, that's gonna be zero. And if I want the color, um, I'm, if I'm gonna do this in uh, hue, saturation, uh, brightness, I can basically do, I can come up with some calculation for hue, so that's gonna be the Y position times some amount. Um, saturation, let's call one, brightness, let's call one. And so, 
let's take a look at our hue. What should our hue be? Hue ranges from red to red on, um, from red to red going from zero to 360. And if we wanted to go kind of blue, uh, if we want to go from like blue to, through purple to red, um, we could start at 180 um, and um, end up at 360. So if we move up three meters, let's call it uh, four meters uh, for good measure, let's multiply our, uh, let's multiply our, our Y dimension, our height value by, um, by 90. So imagine going up, putting something up four meters in the air, um, that's 12 feet high. That would mean at 12, 12 feet high, we're going to end up at um, at a full 360. But what if I want to go from, that should go from red to red. Let's take a look at what that ends up doing. So then we can tinker with it if we don't like it. Okay. Uh, not bad. That's kind of a fun color. That's a decent color range. We'll play with that to begin with. Okay. So. Um, and I'll leave you to kind of work with, uh, you know, mess around with the math to get it where you like it. Um, if you want to really focus on, if you really want to focus on um, doing things with some musical theory, uh, um, feel free to do uh, all kinds of stuff there to get the color to kind of match different notes or, um, you know, various things like that. If you wanted to actually if you want the notes and the colors to cycle on the same intervals through an octave, um, you could absolutely do that. So, um, we now have this thing changing color, but we don't have it changing pitch. It changes color, um, it just stays and floats there, and it glows. Um, we just needed to change pitch, and so um, the pitch, again, is also not uh, happening dynamically, but um, it needs, the pitch needs to uh, change based on the height. And so that could be, that could happen in a variety of ways. Um, and we want this object to, uh, you know, have the note emitter make one sound um, when it emits them. And we want it to make it every single time we hover back over it. So maybe it's the it's actually the sound emitter the the sound emitter here um, that sets the the pitch um, each time this this thing is going to get played maybe it sets the pitch uh, just like this note sphere emitter changed the color right at, at the time it's going to get uh, the note sphere gets emitted so it's changing the color. Maybe, maybe down the down here the note sphere has a sound emitter. Maybe the sound emitter each time it's going to emit a sound, it goes and samples its its height position and then pitches shifts the pitch accordingly. So let's take a look at how we would do that. So on this sound emitter, we could have this sound emitter uh, go to um, events at the very bottom of the sound emitter on emit. So the on emit of this one is going to say OBJ, um, which is now, for this sound emitter, um, is this uh, cello sound right here. Um, and this cello sound, uh, we can, that cello sound, as you, as you know, has a property on it called transpose pitch. And um, if we said OBJ dot lowercase transpose, uppercase PI pitch, uppercase P pitch, Transpose pitch, object dot transpose pitch equals um, self colon get world position dot y. Uh, so if that's the case, the transpose pitch means that um, transpose pitch again um, as a reminder, or for those of you that didn't do the one on the day on day twenty six of thirty days of symmetry. It works in halftone uh, steps, and that means, or semitone steps, and um, there will be 12 in an octave. So if transpose pitch equals 12, that will be one octave higher than the original. If transpose pitch equals 
negative 12, that'll be one octave lower. Uh, and if transpose pitch, uh, you know, equals any integer, that'll be a, a half step. And if it equals some continuous value uh, between 0 and 12, it'll be uh, kind of a continuous uh, s smooth, you know, frequency, uh, a s continuous smooth pitch shift. Uh, between those values. So let's imagine that we want this thing to go from its current value at uh, what's called two meters. Um, so transpose pitch should be zero when we're at two meters, which means that we can subtract two. So at two meters, this will be zero. Um, and at one meter, this will be negative one. And at zero meters this will be negative two but what if we want it to be like an octave per meter so we could multiply if we multiply this by 12 that'll be an octave per meter so if we swing it up to four meters um four meters high will mean that we're at four minus two which is two two times 12 will be 24 so at four meters this thing will be two octaves above itself and uh at zero this thing will be one octave um sorry at zero this thing will be two octaves below so at zero this will be negative two negative two will be negative 24 which will be two octaves below so that'll be quite a bit of of pitch shift so um we still don't hear it until we hover over it so it's interesting um, cool so um, again uh, you know this is just kind of sort of teaching you a basic and a principle and you can you can go and kind of tinker with those values uh, to to get to uh, something interesting something educational something you know fun um, and and uh, what we're going to we're going to continue on with this as it is and now we want this to emit um, a sound uh, as this object moves around so the fr as the snake gets moved around the snake head gets moved around we're going to have um, these objects these uh, spheres that that run behind um, the note spheres they're going to need to play uh, they're going to need to play one of these um, sounds as they get created. So how can we do that? Um, well, there's a couple of ways. I mean, as I emit from here on this on emit event, I suppose I could go get my object and go get its sound emitter and call uh, emit emit want emit node. Um, another thing I can do, it turns out, is that I already have something that does that. I already have a function doing that. If you recall, um, it's very evident. It's our on hover event. So if you look again, on hover. If I edit the code of the notes here, the on hover function that um, that goes ahead and um, finds the sound emitter and emits that node. So if I'm looking at this emitter, every time this emitter emits, the note sphere emits. What if I just go and get? I'll I'll take I'll, I'll change the color of the OBJ, which is that sphere. But I can also that sphere has a function called obj colon on hover uppercase h on hover uppercase o n and if I uh, open close parenthesis so if I call that function as I emit that will be the the hover event so I'm actually I can just sort of get um, a, kind of a, a was that like a a shortcut in a way to to creating that glow, um, uh, sorry, to create that um, that uh, hover event, which is cool too because um, well, we're gonna set the uh, we're gonna set up that handle that grip thing, and you'll see in a second that by using that hover on, I also get the glow um, effect out of it. You don't really see it because this object is uh, comes in translucent um, as you create it. So you don't see the glow right off the bat, um, but uh, but yeah. So just by calling the hover on, 
I get any of the things. I get the glow and I get the um, and I get the emission of the sound at once because that's what's happening under here. Um, uh, when this hovers, um, it gets when it does the on hover on. It also gets this this glow event, um, which is cool. Okay, so cool. We're, we are pitch shifting. We are we are grabbing. We are pitch shifting. We are emitting spheres. Those spheres then have this perpetual interactivity to them, which is awesome. Um, and uh, and now what I want to do is create that object that we. Um, I'll actually, I'll, do, I'll go ahead and do the VR thing, and then we'll create the the the, the cylinder um, to do it. So what you're going to do is uh, to put your VR rig in the space. You're going to click on VR AR. You're going to put this preset VR rig in the space. Comes in with it with its lasers. Aim it so that it's kind of uh, within decent um, in a good position with respect to your snake. And uh, then you go into VR mode here. And uh, I'm going to actually just edit the preferences, uh, the outputs, the HMD. I'm going to add a add a new new screen display, um, and uh, that way that you'll see it not monoscopically, but you'll see it. Or sorry, not stereoscopically. You'll see it monoscopically. And now I should. doesn't leave much of a, um, it only lets 20 simultaneous uh, spheres, it looks like, be in the space um, at any given time. And that's because the max simultaneous of the note sphere emitter um, is set to 20. So let's actually make that a little longer. Um, the, the note sphere emitter uh, clearly has a max simultaneous of 20. And if we set that to like a hundred, we can have a hundred of these objects in the space. So now we can get a much, we can actually fly around with this thing. And then, as I said, you can laser over. Um, so let's imagine that. So th so this is cool. So um, we're going to do two more things. Well, uh, well three. One is um, you notice that when you set up these emitters and you leave these objects in the space, um, you've picked them to be samples, but they're also kind of just like hanging out. Um, if you wanted to clean this up, and uh, you could basically you can put these things in your library and then reference them again uh, from the library. Um, and so that those things don't have to live in your world, they live, um, they live in your library. And uh, these node emitters go and reach for that. So as an example, um, this sound emitter, if I don't want it to be sitting here in the world, I want this node emitter to go grab it from library, what I can do is take the sound emitter, and I can right click and hit add to library. And then I get the note sphere actually living here in the library. And then what I need to do is make this note sphere emitter the emitter that's currently referencing this object, right? So this note sphere, when you go to its sample uh, property, it's called note sphere instance, right? Um, I'm going to change that sample to be the note sphere that we added to the library. So if I grab this note sphere, just click and drag, it now says note sphere library uh, onto our sample, and we're going to emit the one from the library. Now I can actually delete the one uh, in the space. Um, which means that I no longer, oops, go back to the VR mode here. It means that I no longer um, have that sphere. I have kind of a clean, I now have kind of a clean presentation, and this thing still emits, and it emits from the one in, uh, emits from the one in the in the library, um, which is nice. And you could do the same with the sound, right? This sound is the one reference. Uh, in the this this sound is the one referenced by the by the note sphere, so you could do that as well. Um, the um, the interesting thing here is uh, we can also swap out the audio clip that's in here, um, and 
if I don't want to use the the cello and I want to use that bass slap, that bass chop, um, instead I could um, take the audio clip here, this sound clip, and I can go, um, I can bring in this audio clip, the uh, bass chop, and drop that there. So the sound, the sound is not, like I said, the sound is just a spatial wrapper of properties um, that, it's a spatial wrapper of properties um, with, that references an audio clip. And we can swap out that audio clip. Um, and you can, also, you can also change the name of the sound and it doesn't have to be the same name as the, the audio um, clip. It, it, it starts off being that name but it can be changed to, you know, to anything. Um, so this is kind of confusing because this is now call, still called Tim Con Cello, but it's re referencing audio clip. So I could just change this to generic s sound, and that's going to be fine uh, for me to change that name since I'm actually not referencing this sound in code. If you were finding that, if you were referencing that, that if you were finding this object by name, you would need to make sure that um, if you change the name, you're not breaking anything. Um, just one thing to keep in mind. Um, if you're finding it explicitly or you're emitting it, it doesn't matter if you change the name. But what should happen now, since we've we've changed, uh, sound shouldn't cause any issue. That that'll, that'll just make it sort of generic. Um, we change the audio clip, so this means that the the audio clip getting emitted by um, by note sphere, and you'll see it here, um, is is uh, is this object in the library, and the library is um, is looking for this one, and so it was emitting an object that played the. Um, it, will, it was emitting the object that played the cello, and now it plays the bass chop. Um, cool. So the last thing I want to do is create this this what I call kind of the, the magic hoop or whatever the um, or the magic uh, butterfly net, which is um, a cylinder that you can then uh, you can then. Uh, it's a tube, rather, that you can, like a ring that you can then grab and swing over the, the notes and um, activate them. And the way that we're going to create that is uh, by creating a ring using the entities tube. And we'll make it um, fairly large, um, kind of a thin, thin ring, extrude it so that there's kind of some distance. Uh, and uh, the one thing that we're going to do with this now under its properties is uh, let's make it like a, a darker neutral color. We'll make it like a dark gray. Um, we're going to make its rigid body active false because we want it, as we lift it in the air, we want it to kind of just stay there. Um, and uh, we don't want this thing to be trigger activating because we're going to put a trigger on it. And we don't want there to be any confusion. So we got rid of, um, we made the rigid body active false, we removed the rigid, uh, sorry, we removed trigger activating and we made it gray. The last thing we want to do is make the put interactions grabbable fixed on it so that we can grab it in VR. And then uh, we're going to put a trigger on it that's actually going to be, you could use a plane, but I'm going to teach you something that is fun to do, that's useful by using the box. So using the box uh, trigger, we're going to kind of draw a square that pretty much covers that that circle. Let's square the circle here. Let me make it a little smaller so it's um, so a sphere can't get through here and here but so that you don't have positive false positives out here. Um, and make it the same width as this this uh, this box. Or sorry, this ring. Make the box trigger the same as this this tube entity. We call it, we can call the tube entity. Um, just call it ring for now. Tube would be fine. I'm gonna grab the trigger uh, words. I'm a child it to ring. So I'm gonna grab trigger child it to ring. So now um, wherever ring goes, trigger goes too. And this trigger now, um, basically these spheres, uh, the spheres that we um, 
these note spheres, as you recall, they uh, are interactable on hover and they're trigger activating. So when this trigger passes over them, they will activate the triggers uh, on enter and on exit codes. Um, so if we right click on this trigger and hit on enter, shorten, we will open up the Lua uh, scripting window with an on enter event. Um, another way to do this would go to the tr go to the trigger and hit on enter and let's also make an on exit. So what we want to do is uh, when we enter, we want to um, we want to make that object glow and when we, when it exits, we want it to um, we want it to stop glowing. Um, and so it's actually quite simple. You could put you could sit here and put code in here that would be OBJ and run like animate that glow. You could force this. Um, you you could you could then also say, oh, if it's if it's the type of object that can emit a sound, make it emit a sound. But we don't actually need to do that. We're going to go quite simple, and we're just going to say, hey, when you get in, when you first pass into this ring, I want you to I want to call your on hover event. It's not the it's not the same as hovering over the the sphere with your laser or with this cursor. But it accomplishes the same thing. It's gonna it's gonna trigger a glow event, and it's gonna trigger the sound uh, emitting the 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 sound. And so it's as simple as saying, okay, when the uh, when this sphere, um, when that sphere that we we bring in, when this sphere passes through, let's call it its on hover event. When it exits, let's call it its its hover off event. Um, so it's sort of like active when it's in this zone. Um, and we'll tinker with the dimensions here in a second to make sure that they work. Let's also make sure that our snake doesn't have a trigger activating on it. We don't want the snake head to be um, uh, activating this trigger. Okay, so what we wanna do on this trigger is um, basically say obj colon on hover on. And then the on exit, we're going to say obj colon on hover off. And that's just very much is what we did as well with this emitter. We just called that same same thing as well, the on hover on event. So let's take a look um, at uh, now grabbing and waving this, this uh, ring over these spheres. Oh, I thought I have a hover off event. Perhaps I don't, and I need to create it. Let's go to our note sphere and take a look at our interactable. I think if we simply uh, all we need to do is hit on hover off to make sure we have a hover off event here. Let's see if that if that accomplishes it. I think it was looking for a hover off event that it did not have. Fly over here. And these hovers are working. I'm not seeing the glow. Perhaps, uh, we are hearing, um, and so yeah, the the glow lives down below. So um, we could actually change this um, on our note. Um, Let's bring our note sphere back into the space and tinker with it before um, adding it back to the library. I'm gonna actually bring it back in here um, into the space. And uh, this note note sphere, what we're gonna do is move the glow um, code uh, actually into the, the, the full um, hover event um, up here. And we'll go ahead and set the um, 
set this, the note steer note, uh, note emitter. Um, we're going to set its sample to the one, no longer the one in the library, but we're going to pick the one here in the space. So we've sort of rewired it to the one in the space, and now let's do a little thing on the uh, on this uh, steer here. Um, uh, the other way that we could do this, just to be, just in, just since we know we can do it, um, so I can either I can either stick this code, this this glow code, uh, up in from off this um, this sort of node that feeds up. I can either um, I can either stick it into the actual hover on or hover off uh, function here to get the glowing to take place. Um, or I can call the on hover event here as well as find the glow event and call that there. Um, let's actually do uh, the first one that I suggested, which is that um, in this trigger, let's call the objects on hover on. So that's going to be this note sphere. And then let's call, find um, its node by name, find its child node by name, uh, glow. So we'll say obj colon find node by name and quote glow unquote colon and also run the hover on event there and then we'll do the same thing but do on hover off that event which I believe should get us to get a glow event uh, when we when we hover over this thing. There it is. Not bad, not bad at all. This one remains. So that is um, some fundamentals of of Sound Snake. It's kind of cool that you can see two emitters. Sort of stacking up, and you could imagine um, potentially working that kind of cascading layers of emitters, right? Because this one has an emitter on it, which emits a thing and does uh, one dynamic thing to it by changing its color, and then the emitter that's on this sphere emits a sound, and it's dynamically changing the pitch. And we've sort of spaced out the pitch and the um, the pitch and the color across these two emitters, but you could also imagine that this thing emits something that's also grabbable that you could still move around and you could end up with kind of a web of, you know, these objects, um, you know, emitting from, you know, other objects and you could kind of build a whole web of sound or, you know, different things like that. Um, and then this is pretty cool, this kind of hover, um, the, the ability to just make hover do a number of different things and then you can also just access hover whether you want to make the sound emit by calling on hover at the moment that you actually emit it from here or I can use a trigger and the trigger can just pass can just say oh you've got a function that makes you glow and then plays a sound and then makes you unglow let me just use that instead of repeating all that. And so that's what we did here. We made the object glow, which gives you this cool side effect that you can, that the thing stays glowing while, it, while it's inside this object. So you can have multiple things kind of in that force field zone, kind of the, the width of this. You end up with this nice, um, this nice kind of a uh, sense of, of, kind of activating depth of that, like, um, that, uh, so I'm just going to do this. I was going to make these just a little bit. See if I took this, this, uh, ring, took the ring and I make it, um, the tube shape a little bit bigger, like so. I make this trigger. A little bit fatter, a little bit deeper here. Trigger, just center it, kind of, and then uh, there will be more things in that in the ring zone, right? So now multiple can fit in at the same time, and you can see there.
kind of a nice side effect of sort of calling a um, you know a function that activates something and then call it while it's inside the ring and then or inside the trigger um, technically and then uncalling it or, you know shutting it off on its way out which is has that I rather enjoy the way that, that ends up looking so cool so this has been sound snake and uh, I think you can do kind of a lot with the basic principles there.